Good morning, and thank you very much for having me here. A pleasure. I to come out to see my great state of Colorado. I live over on the east side in Boulder, and um, don't come out here as often as I wish. Um, and I'm thrilled also to get to talk to our most of people who are out doing the work to restore our rivers. I actually had some field jobs early in my career. I was a park ranger at Lake Verde, and I spent summer as a field tech out in California for the National Park Service. And then something went awry. I guess somebody noticed my nerdy tendencies. <laughs> um, I've been stuck in meeting rooms ever since, but um, I, it's, it's nice to feel like I still have some connection to folks who are out uh, making it work on the ground. So, uh, continuing in our binational theme, I, I am going to tell you some stories today about how we've been working on restoration of the Colorado River Delta. So we're up in upper basin of Colorado. I think most people here, raise your hands for you from the Colorado River Watershed, Colorado River Basin. So most people, but not everybody. Okay, so I'm talking about where uh, the river sometimes makes it down to the Gulf of California. I'll show you a map in a second. But a moment first about um, Environmental Defense Fund, where I work. Um, it's a national nonprofit organization. We have offices around the country, but specifically relevant for those of you who are working on restoration in the basin. EDF is working with a number of other uh, environmental groups, uh, including Nature Conservancy, Western Resource Advocates, Charter Limited, and Corona Torta Northwest Bay. Uh, in a, so we're not a uh, formal coalition, but we're collaborating to think about flows, healthy river flows in the Colorado River Basin uh, from top to bottom, and actually hot off the press, and have a brochure that we put together called Healthy Flows for the Colorado River Basin. I don't, I only have one copy, I literally got this yesterday, but I want to let you know about it, and I think if you check any of these organizations' websites, a couple of weeks from now, you'll find uh, this brochure available online. So uh, we are really expanding, our, or we are working basin-wide, but again, my, the bulk of my experience is kind of the U.S. Mexico border, so I am talking today about the Delta. Um, so just, so I think this basin needs no introduction here, but uh, we're talking about, okay, I lost the laser point already, so, uh, I'm talking about this aerial breakdown here, where we're draining the, the river, um, sometimes it's like that. And um, so this bit Julie said, this is a story without an ending. And it is a story without an ending, but I also have to bring to your attention the fact that in today's New York Times, there is an editorial by John Waterman, who actually lives over in Carbondale. Um, he's a oftentimes writer for National Geographic. Um, he floated the river a few years ago from his home in Carbondale down to the Delta where he had to walk. Uh, and he uh, put a piece in the paper today encouraging the United States and Mexico to, um, to get it together and do what they can to restore this river. So it's a, it's a very live issue at this point. Uh, whoops, wrong way, sorry. So, I just wanted to show you a satellite photo of the Delta, um, and you can see the green there is actually the footprint of agriculture, which essentially shows you where uh, the green Delta was pre-development of the Colorado River, but today we're using so much of the water for agriculture, not just here in this region, but up and down the river, as well as for to meeting our urban needs, other other water consumptive needs, energy development, et cetera, as basin. Um, but you can see where the Delta was in that agricultural footprint. Um, sorry, I keep going one way. Uh, and a, a story I think that most people know, which is that this region now, below the last dam on the river, has been deprived of flows, this um, aged flows below the last dam on the river, showing the com near complete deprivation of water when uh, Lake Powell was filling behind Lake Canyon Dam through the 60s and 70s. And then we went into some wet periods uh, in the 80s, big El Nino flows, and then 
the sad story where it kind of fades out. Uh, but as you can see, not very much flow happening in, in recent years. Um, there have been uh, some efforts over the last decade plus to try to get something going, restoring flows to the Colorado River Delta. And um, NGOs really have been engaged for more than 15 years now trying to uh, get the powers that be that manage water in this basin, particularly the federal governments of the United States and Mexico, thinking about how to restore flows. It's got, we, one thing we realized from the beginning is this has got to be a collaborative uh, effort between the two countries because while most of the delta fit in Mexico, uh, the faucets on the river are all in the United States, and so it really is going to take a collaborative effort between the two nations to restore those flows. So, um, one thing we did early on was to define conservation priorities, and we did that in a publication uh, called Conservation Priorities for the Colorado River Delta that basically um, articulated what species of interest were in this region, what their habitats were, and then went so far as to express uh, what their water needs were. Not what are the water needs of our pre-development delta, but what are some modest and minimum flows that would be required to support the habitats that are supporting those species of interest. Um, and we were able to, in a very uh, coarse and approximated way, uh, estimate what the water needs were for the riparian system with a base flow and a pulse flow that would occur um, once every few years. Uh, some of the effort to try to um, get things moving included a campaign by a group called Living Rivers called 1% for the Delta. They actually went around the basin talking to municipalities that use Colorado River water. This was about 2001 when they were doing that. Um, and got the municipalities to sign up to commit that they would conserve 1% of their water use uh, for the benefit of the Delta. But of course, there's so much in the way of the legal and institutional framework that governs how the Colorado River is managed and used, that in fact that effort, while it was great getting people's attention, and of course the municipality is where everybody lives, so there was uh, this great vehicle for building awareness, it didn't actually deliver, wasn't, wasn't able to deliver any water to the Delta. Um, there was uh, some federal rulemaking in 2001 about uh, surplus deliveries to water users in the lower basin of the Colorado in the United States. And we tried to assert that while they were handing out, formally codifying hand, the way to hand out surpluses of Colorado River water when we're in wet period, that the federal government might also think about uh, putting some water into this habitat in the Delta. Uh, but that was found to be beyond the purpose and need of uh, the federal government's policy making. Uh, however, as a sort of booby prize for that effort, the Department of Interior and the State Department put together something known as Minute 306, which a minute is a, um, a piece of paper that gets signed by officials from the United States and Mexico that adds further definition to the treaty relationship we have on the Colorado River, which is the treaty from 1944. So, they, so we're actually today up to 318 minutes, but back in 2004 they passed Minute 306 that basically said the two countries understand, acknowledge that the Colorado River Delta is important, that both countries have an interest in this habitat, and that we should um, work together to figure this out. It, we had no teeth, no commitments, but it did put on paper for the first time uh, a formal acknowledgement between the two nations that this um, habitat area was important. There was also an attempt um, that concluded in 2003 by defenders of wildlife to litigate to get flows into the Delta. And what the courts found is that the treaty actually trumps any other body of law in the United States, saying that um, we give Mexico their treaty allocation on the river, but that U.S. law essentially does not, other U.S. law does not apply in this circumstance. Um, so, 
Um, so before we even get to that, I just wanted to sort of interrupt myself and tell a story. So I sort of set the frame now, and you're probably wondering what I actually have to do with any of this, or, or why I'm telling this story, or you know, what I've been doing since I was a park ranger. Um, I wanted to tell you about a day in 2007 when I flew down to San Diego and I took the trolley down to the border and I met in a parking lot a handful of officials from U.S. water management agencies from the Central Arizona Project, from the Southern Nevada Water Authority, um, I think uh, Arizona Department of Water Resources was there, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California was there, and I got these folks walking through the gates across the border. Uh, we went down into Central Tijuana to a McDonald's where we sat and drank coffee for a few minutes while we waited for a van to come pick us up and uh, take us down to Colac, which is a university uh, on the south end of Tijuana where we had set up a meeting for these folks for the first time to enter into a conversation with the Mexican water manager and Arzelina Hosa, who um, is going to be speaking with you later today about on the ground restoration efforts in Mexico, was at this meeting along with a number of other colleagues of mine from the US and Mexico, from the nonprofit community. And that was, I would say, the first time we had a conversation about how Colorado River management could be improved at the U.S.-Mexico border, including uh, the environmental issues, but also including um, some other water management issues between the two countries around, um, you know, around the treaty, uh, provide perhaps looking for ways to provide some more flexibility that could benefit water users in both the United States and Mexico. So since that uh, trip across the border with um, some water managers from the U.S. who were shortly wondering where I was taking them and what we were up to, uh, we've actually things have come a long way, and there are now formal uh, negotiations between the United States and Mexico, which may uh, or may not be successful probably in the next month, but we basically got this ramped up in 2007, and we think uh, we have a pretty short window to get them done before it becomes election season in Mexico uh, later this spring. So, um, one of the ways that we were able to gain currency or get the attention of water managers in the United States has to do with this chart, which I think most people have probably seen by right now, I hope you have. It uh, shows the demand and supply lines for the entire Colorado River Basin on a 10-year running average, and the pink line on the top is the supply, and it bounces around, that's the historic record, again, 10 years for the average, and the blue line is all consumptive demand, not diversion actual consumptive demand on the river. And what you can see is that at the far right side, and this only goes up for about 2007, um, that those lines have crossed. Now, this has made a lot of news, right? So we had a few years ago people noticing that big bathtub ring uh, at Lake Mead and the water levels dropping. And of course, those of us who've been working on the Colorado River Delta knew this story was in the works because we knew that there hadn't been any water reaching the Delta uh, for years. And so those are the two uh, most visible, tangible uh, uh, impacts of the fact that we're using more water than the basin yields on an average annual uh, basis. One thing we have going for us in the Colorado River Basin is that our storage capacity is vast. It's about four times the river's annual average flow, so it's taken us quite a while to eat our way through the storage. The delta's been dry for the longest, and now we have a big bathtub ring uh, at Mead. The water, la la last year was a fabulous snowpack year, and there was a huge equalization release from Powell into Mead, so there was actually more water in the lower base now, although there's still a bathtub ring. Um, but it provided some relief in the short term 
Um, before we had that big snow pack year, that paper of record one time, happy about your, um, your op-ed in the paper today, you know, had this, this in, the, in the New York Times, they were taking notice of water supply in the West. It was sort of shocking. A white unthinkable day is looming on the Colorado River. Barring a sudden end to the Southwest 11 year drought, the distribution of the river's dwindling bounty is likely to be reordered as early as next year because the flow of water cannot keep pace with the region's demands. And um, that certainly had the water manager's attention, and they had set up shortage guidelines for the states in the lower basin, Arizona, California, and Nevada. They uh, were very interested in talking to Mexico about managing supply in dry times. And then since that time, while we did have a big snowpack here last year, we've gotten much better at downscaling. Uh, the projected impacts of climate change in this space, and this is a reclamation projection on the left, is that same chart of the supply and the demand, and on the right hand side, and it's fuzzy because that shows you there's uncertainty, um, they uh, have continued the blue line, which is the supply line, and you can see that there's somewhat of a decline trend there. Um, of course, tremendous uncertainty around that, and, and then the demand line, the red line, which continues to grow because recession notwithstanding, uh, everybody expects people to continue to move to this region, and that means that water demands continue to rise. So that's a big gap, and the gap keeps getting bigger, and uh, there has been a great desire by water managers in the region to get together and think about how to address it, and beyond that, to think about how Mexico can help uh, in this conversation. So I, as I pointed out, rivers over allocated, population growth in um, drought since 2001, and yes, we had a big water year this year, last year, but uh, I don't know, I drove, but even though I had to drive through a snowstorm last night, uh, there was not a lot of snow up there this year, but a lot of concerns about where we're going to end up spring, although we're just still in it. Um, so, uh, in, so really, um, at the time, we got these conversations going in the vein of crisis avoidance. We were about to hit the shortage triggers uh, at Lake Mead, so lower basin shortages would be triggered by lake elevation. Um, and so, uh, and that is still the thought going forward, that we should be reducing our uses of Colorado River water before we hit those triggers where people are, in, are, are shut off um, in, uh, in ways that they can't handle it so well. So uh, there's, a, uh, there's a conversation with Mexico about voluntary reductions in water use, similar in approach to how the states have managed it domestically. And there's also a conversation with Mexico about them being able to use need for storage so that they can bank some water to help them get through times of shortages, but also critically, get back to the environmental piece, uh, to be able to uh, store water to create those pulse flows that will help with the overbank flooding, that will help set up the conditions so that Conatora can go in and do successful restoration projects. Um, the United States basically set up domestic rulemaking in 2007 that, that gives uh, these flexibilities to themselves in the lower basin states, and so now the conversation is with Mexico coming to extend these agreements. So the content, in a sort of big picture way of the discussions with Mexico are about supply management, water banking, there's also an element where we're talking about my national investment. Uh, in augmentation and conservation projects, meaning possible uh, joint U.S.-Mexican sea cell facilities on the Pacific Coast in Rosarito, and also possibly U.S. investments in conservation, water conservation um, in the Mexicali Valley. But most importantly, and nearest and dearest to my heart, is the potential for the two countries to make affirmative and substantive commitments with teeth this time uh, to putting some water back into the Colorado River Delta. And I just want to end, uh, I'm out of time I know, but with one quick story which is about a wetland in the Delta called the Cienega de Santa Clara, actually off channel. It receives drain water from uh, Ag District in Southern Arizona, a couple of them off the irrigation and drainage district. And uh, that drain water can 
might be used at a plant called the Yuma Dissolving Plant, which would treat that water, put it back in the river. Um, the United States wanted to test this plant, been built and sitting around, it's kind of mothballed for more than a decade. But we want, they wanted to give it a test run, and actually, really, some of the water users who were the wanted to give it a test run, but the feds had to operate it. And they wanted to run a pilot, but there was great concern from environmental organizations and from the Republic of Mexico over what that would do to this wetland that has come to be dependent on this drain water flow. And before that pilot started, uh, the two countries agreed in a minute, or we were up to 316 at that point, uh, to commit to making sure that during the test of the human dissolving plant, flows to this wetland would remain unimpaired. So uh, we have a precedent for the United States and Mexico saying we can put water into the environment in the Colorado River Delta. It's the first time they've done that separately or together. And so it is with that example in mind that I have tremendous hopes for their potential to do something in a prospective new minute, which would be minute 319. Um, keep your fingers crossed. And thank you very much. I think we have time for one question for Jennifer. There's a question over there. Hi, my name is Chuck Cullen, the Central Arizona Project. Um, what, uh, the two questions wrapped into one. Uh, since the Colorado River system is over allocated and Pursuant to the 22 Compact, the water is held by the states. What role really do you see the federal government of the U.S. playing in providing water supplies that's held by the states for environmental purposes, which would, I think, to your, your presentation, be for a federal purpose? And then the second half of that, since the Republic of Mexico has uh, a similar treaty amount of water, 1.5 million acre feet, and regular, regularly receives 200,000 acre feet above that every year, what is the impediment for Mexico to invest in environmental restoration with their existing water? Um, let's see, I'll kind of take it backwards. Mexico has been investing in restoration with their water, and they are, the Republic of Mexico is working with uh, the Colorado River Delta Water Trust that was established by Fernandora, leading the way for a group of environmental organizations to be able to acquire water rights in the Mexicali Valley and uh, apply those, that water, that wet water, to restoration projects. So um, they are beginning to do that. And what Chuck um, sent me up with this question to make sure that you all understand that we're not going to open the gates that need to supply uh, our precious water reserves to Colorado River Delta just uh, as simply as saying, oh, we have a little water to spare and let it flow, but rather the way that this prospective minute, this prospective agreement between the United States and Mexico is likely to make that commitment is with uh, a commitment from the U.S. Of dollars to support conservation projects in Mexico that help them to conserve the water and then also to give Mexico the tool of being able to store water in need over multiple years and then release it as needed to both address those shortage needs and also to uh, create that overbank flooding that we think is going to be key in uh, setting up the right conditions for habitat for a successful habitat restoration project on the ground in Mexico. So that's a sort of a fine point. It's a very important to us water buffaloes. But, um, but uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, I think what's critical is that in the sort of world of politics and appearances, the United States needs Mexico to be restoring the Delta, and Delta that Mexico needs the United States to be restoring the Delta. And the private sector has checked in and said, "We will match you in your commitments, United States and Mexico, if you put 
some resources on the table to make this work. The private sector actually will, you know, if this minute goes through uh, the way we hope it will, uh, the Colorado River Delta Water Trust will also ha ha be uh, implicated with a commitment of water to uh, help make this closed program work. Thank you.